Welcome to the show Plus Sports Special on a Saturday. And today, a large amount of the program will go to cricket. I have a guest coming later on the show. Uh, he'll talk about his um, competition and what it's about. My name is Wally Scott. I'm watching Wally Dagba in the meantime. Um, we'll discuss um, cricket for now until our guest arrives. And um, Aho, what's happening to him? Thank you very much, Wally Scott. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, the name you mentioned is the captain of Foundation Cricket Club, which is the oldest club in Nigeria. Uh, Peter Aho is a Nigerian player, uh, a bowler and a batter. On October 24, 2021, which was a Sunday, there was a record that he created. And what happened is Nigeria played a bilateral series against Syria alone. It was a six-match bilateral series at the Unilag Cricket Over. That was a way to launch that cricket over that was just done by the Unilag Cricket alumni, which was spearheaded by the president of the Nigerian Care Federation, Mr. Uya Pata, who is also an alumnus of the University of Lagos. And they did it in honor of their former manager and somebody that they can call uh, their, their coach, um, the, uh, Professor Adekukoi. So they now invited Sierra Leone to come down because there's been a bit of rivalry between Nigeria and Sierra Leone from time back. Uh, and Peter Aho played the first two matches. But he wasn't convincing in the eyes of the coach, Asanka. And what happened? He decided to drop him for the third and fourth match. But this man you are seeing on your screen came back in the fifth match and did something amazing that will go down history as a world record. He bowled 3.4 overs and he had six wickets for five runs, one maiden in that 3.4 overs, including an attrick. And you know in football, when they say you score an attrick, you score three goals. But in cricket, hat trick means you bowled three consecutive balls and you had three consecutive wickets. His record has just been ratified by the Guinness World Record as the best bowling figure in one day international, be it T20 or ODI. They said his bowling statistics of six wickets for five runs in 3.54 overs and one maiden was better than that of Chaha of India when he had a record against... Um, Bangladesh. They said his record is better than that of Dinesh Nakrami of Uganda when he had record against Lesotho. They also said his bowling statistics is better than that of Ajanta Mendes of Sri Lanka. He had almost similar record against Zimbabwe. And so for me, Peter Aho, thumbs up to you for putting Nigeria on the world map for the positive reasons. So Guinness World Record Peter Aho, best bowling statistics in the world, anywhere in the world. Six wickets for five runs, 3.4 overs and one maiden. He had to take the coach, dropping him for two matches because he didn't play the third match. He didn't play the fourth game. He now came back in the fifth and that spurred him on to achieve that record. Still talking about Nigerian cricket, our coach, an high-performance manager, and a World Cup winner with Sri Lanka in 1996, who was appointed on the 1st of December of 2020, Deshabandu Asanka Pradiguru Sinha. His tenure was supposed to end in 2022. But during the Nigerian Cricket Federation T20 competition that Nigeria hosted among five countries, which Rwanda eventually won and Nigeria finishing second, and we had countries like the Gambia, Sierra Leone, and Ghana, on the 30th of March, he tendered a resignation letter to the board of the Nigerian Care Federation that he needed to travel to Australia for his shoulder treatment. He had a shoulder problem. And this news was kept by the Federation up until last weekend when they had trial matches because Nigeria is preparing for an African Cricket Association competition and also a T20 World Cup qualifier. But venue and date yet to be known. So he invited 36 players into the camp, and he divided them into 12, group, uh, 12 players in three groups, making 36. But one conspicuous man that was missing is Joshua Yonike, the former captain 
of the national team. We said he wanted to take a break from national team duties, but we have a new captain now in Sylvester uh, Okwe. Now, after the trial matches, the norm is... I wish I can see the pictures of uh, Asanka, the national team manager, uh, to you know, buttress um, what I'm talking about. After the trial matches, they were supposed to release 24 players out of that 36, and 12 would be asked to go. But unfortunately, even the selector said, in the history of Nigerian cricket, they have not seen a stiff competition like that. Those selectors, the likes of James Okpara, Ogbonaya, uh, Shewondeku, Oladipo Idowu, and Kofi Sego could not, you know, that's the coach, Asanka. He, he was at that venue that he now disclosed to a lot of people that he will be leaving at the end of this month, although his contract would expire in June of 2022. He came as a rude shock to a lot of people, but the board of the federation knew about this thing from March when okay. he submitted that resignation letter. So he has to go for that shoulder. But he said... Are we expecting him back? He is not coming. But they cannot create a lacuna. So the Nigerian Cricket Federation would have to appoint another coach to take over from him because we don't know when his shoulder will heal and they don't want to create that vacuum. This man said because of the love Nigerians have shown him and the players that he has seen, he will still love to offer his expert advice to the federation because he cuts across all the national teams. All the national teams from under 17 to under 20 uh, to the female team to everything to under 19. He supervises over them and he gives coaching experience to all the other ones. So we wish Asanka all the best in his quest to get his shoulder fixed. He's a World Cup winner with Sri Lanka in 1996. Um, quickly, there is a competition that is coming up in Oyo State. They call it the Legends Cup. Everywhere you look to, there is development that's happening in cricket. And what is this Legend Cup all about? There are four people. It's like they are season opener. This is a package of the Oyo State Sports Council in collaboration with Oyo State Cricket Association. So from May 7 to May 8 at the Obafemi Awolo um, Stadium, there would be cricket matches. Four teams, both male and female, they have been selected, plus friends and players of the honorees. They would form a team. The window for you to indicate your interest to be part of this competition will end by tomorrow because the competition starts on the 7th and 8th. Now, those four teams are the four people that they want to honor. That's why they call it the Legends Cup. We had the likes of Professor Jide Bademosi, who will be honored on Sunday. They have the likes of Mr. Kolade Musoro, who will be honored. They have Mr. Oge Alakija, who will also be honored, and Debola Ogunshino. I think we have um, Yes, we have, we, have, we, have, we have the, we have the, 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 the we have, team yeah. that shows that competition. So, Oge Alakija, Debola Ogushino, Professor Babajide Bademosi, and Mr. Kolade Musoro. These four is where they will now pick the teams from, both male and female, plus their friends. And that's why they said they have four teams. So they will play more, what looks more like a semi-final, top place, and then final. That is the commission we are talking about that is coming up uh, in uh, Oyo State, Obafemi Awolo, Liberty Stadium Cricket Over. And I was speaking to the chairman of the organizing committee, Abayo Mioke. He said, subsequently, who continue to honor as more cricketers that have invested and developed the game of cricket in Southwest or your state. But this first set of people, Professor Jide Bademosi, uh, Debola Ogushino, Oge Alakija, and Kolade Musoro, will be the first people that will be honored Saturday and Sunday. So 
anybody that wants to play for them will be playing for these four teams. So it's safe to say that the four teams will be named in honor of these yeah. people. So you have Team Jide Bademosi, uh, Team Ogushino, Team Musoro, and Team Alakija. Male and female selected from Oyo State. So Obafemi are only Oyo State. Oh, mainly for Oyo State people, but they are friends can also join to say they want to be part of this thing, to play this competition. So, trophies, medals, plaques will be definitely be presented March, May 7 and 8 next week. The venue is that place I talked about. About me, okay, I said, this is like a precursor to the start of the cricket season in Oyo, Oyo State. State okay. So, for me, this is fantastic and Great players have come out of your state also to play for national team. True. So the development cannot be overemphasized. And I say big thumbs up to Abayo Miyoke, the chairman planning committee, and all those who have put this together to honor people. Like we always say, honor people while they are alive, not when they are gone. Appreciate what they have done. And I think this is highly commendable. This will spur some other people on to say, Let's do what we can do to support the growth of cricket because people will definitely honor us. <clears throat> okay, well, we're still going to come back to cricket yeah. this morning. But um, let's look at the fact that the Super Falcons will face rivals South Africa, Burundi, and Botswana in Group C of the 2022 Women's African Cup of Nations in Morocco. Now, in the past, Falcons don't fear any foes, really. South Africa, Botswana, we don't fear them. I don't expect us to fear them, but the only fear in all of this is that this competition is from July 2nd to 23rd, right there in uh, Morocco. Morocco yeah. And South Africa have shown that they can be a turn in the flesh. We should beat Botswana. We should beat Burundi. Our last game will even be South Africa. And by then, we should have qualified for the uh, quarterfinal because... They have three groups. The top two teams will make six, plus the best two losers. South Africa looks like a turn in the flesh. Why am I saying this? In 2018, we played South Africa in one round 80 minutes. We could not even score them, and that was in Ghana. Though we defeated them in the final, 4-3 on penalty kicks. Yeah. But in the first game of the group, we were also in the same group, Tembi in Gatlana. Scored the only goal in the fifth minute, they beat Nigeria. And when we met them in the final, and that was under Thomas Deneby, we could not be, break, break them down. They came to Nigeria for the Aisha Buhari Cup. They beat Nigeria at the Mobalaji Johnson Stadium. So they would always want to prove, like, Desire Ellis has done a fantastic job on this team. Sure that. And I, I know it's going to be a feisty competition. Other countries, too, have grown in leaps and bounds. But more importantly, Wale, I am looking at the bigger picture, which is in 2023, when New Zealand will be hosting the World Cup. And I hope we'll get a ticket to the World Cup. And not only getting a ticket to the World Cup, but going to make an indelible mark at the World Cup. The last time we did anything meaningful at the World Cup was back in 1999, under Ismail Amabo, where we got to the quarterfinal. Since then, we've been struggling. So I hope the girls can go out and give their best shot. Let's look at the EPL fixtures for this weekend up until Monday. Of course, um, there are some tough matches um, going to go down, but man, you don't get to play till Monday. Yeah. Yes, but there are some tough matches Saturday and Sunday. Um, Newcastle will take on Liverpool, a rejuvenated Newcastle. Surprisingly, these two teams have the most points in year 2022. Liverpool have the most points, followed by Newcastle. And that's a shocking thing. And I'm talking about, don't get me wrong, I'm talking about from January of 2022. These two teams have the most points. And Liverpool will say to themselves, we smell blood. They have done the hard work from the first leg of the semi-final of the Champions League against Villarreal. 2-0 lead is an healthy lead. And I'm sure Liverpool will know that if they beat Newcastle, they go temporarily top up until the period where Leeds United will take on Manchester City. So I think Liverpool have enough in their arsenal to get the better of Eddie Howe, who have done a fantastic job by taking Newcastle from that relegation murky waters 
now into the ninth position. Newcastle definitely will lose against Liverpool, but I'm sure it will not come easy. Um, quick one, Southampton against Crystal Palace is of no much relevance, but Crystal Palace are trying to stay off um, relegation. relegation. You know, I, they've been having a yo-yo season. Uh, Patrick Vieira has done a fantastic job on the team, but not to where they expect. And for Southampton, Rafa Zanotto, you don't know which Southampton will turn up uh, on the day they are going to play. Um, Tottenham Lister. Yeah. That will Tottenham be a match to watch. In 180 minutes, while they have not had a shot on target in their last two fixtures, and it came as a surprise to everyone that in 180 minutes, they've not had a shot on target. They don't want that fourth position to slip out of their hands, though they are fifth currently behind the North London rival, Arsenal. So they know they need to get a result against a Leicester City. Leicester City, I don't know what Brenda Rogers will be doing. He has his eyes fixated on the semi-final second leg of the uh, UEFA Conference League, where they are playing out a one-on draw against Jose Mourinho's AS Roma. So will he rest his players for that second leg, or he will feel them? That remains to be seen. They are not fighting relegation, and they are not going to win any uh, title. They yeah. are not getting any <clears throat> European. So I think it's just best for him to focus on that semi-final where anything can see happen. Uh, West, West Ham, Ham against United. Arsenal. Hey. That's the problem. West Ham are a boogie team. They narrowly lost against Chelsea last weekend. And in the midweek, they also lost against Entran Frankfurt. They have a return leg against Frankfurt. But I can't look beyond them getting a result against Frankfurt because that was how we ruled them out against Olympic Lyon when they played the 1-0 draw at the London Stadium. But they went to Lyon and beat Lyon 3-0. Frankfurt are a difficult position because Frankfurt, uh, in the last 10 matches in Europa League, they've not lost. And at home, they've won one out of five matches, but they are a tough not to break down. So Arsenal also, the confidence is back. Fourth position, their faith is in their hands, not in the hands of anybody, True. because they defeated Manchester United and they defeated Chelsea against all the odds. Scored seven goals in two games is not a main feat. So let's jump to Everton against Chelsea now. Oh, Everton are fighting relegation. True. They don't want to go down because there are only two clubs in the history of <coughs> the <coughs> Premier League that have not gone on relegation. And that is Arsenal and Everton. Everton lost the Merseyside derby in a bit of controversial fashion against um, Liverpool because they felt they should have gotten what looks like a penalty and they were not given. And don't forget that Everton have been a victim of circumstance. Uh, the same thing happened to them against Manchester City. They had to take the Premier League referees apologizing to Frank Lampard. And I'm saying, what does the apology do? Will he give them that penalty that they were unjustly not given or what? And for Chelsea, the player they won or draw against Manchester United. It was not expected, despite creating the chances. And Thomas Tuchel was livid that all the chances they created from Kayavat to Rhys James and all of them, they didn't convert it. They need to bounce back. Whether they can get the result against Everton remains to be seen. But Everton also, they know they don't want to go down. If they go down, it will be disastrous. Leeds United against Man City. Man City, Man City know Liverpool will play first. And once Liverpool wins, they go top. They don't want to sleep. The eyes of Pep Guardiola is, I want to win a double, if possible. Win the Champions League, which has been the only girl for Man City, and all, win the league. Will he focus more on the return leg at this match? About, or focus on the ball. But one thing I've learned from Pep is that the game in front of him, he focuses more on that. Yeah. So I'm sure he will put all his best legs in this game. He will put all his best legs in this game. But Jesse Marsh has done a fantastic job. He has done a fantastic job in the sense that his last five matches, they are unbeaten. He has been able to mismatch attacking and defending. Calvin Phillips is back. Not like those days of Marcelo Bielsa, where they just open up their defense and they concede lots of goals. So Bielsa is no longer there. Jesse Marsh is there. And their last five matches... And if you look at the way Man City have also been playing, they've been playing some Cincinnati football. Uh, you saw how they destroyed Watford. True. And the way they scored four against a certain Real Madrid. They are bored in confidence and they want to get results. I think Man City have enough 
against and finally, finally we look at Manchester United against Bradford. That's Don't a talk Monday. about Manchester United. <laughs> Manchester United is not just a team at all. When was the last time United got a victory? Two out of about ten. The only positive is David Gear and of course Cristiano Ronaldo. And each time people talk about Cristiano Ronaldo saying it's the problem of United, I just laugh. And I said eight out of nine goals Ronaldo has scored. He's the joint second highest goal scorer in the English Premier League. At with 37. You, yes, with you, my son. What more do you expect? It shows that the other guys are not coming into the party, unlike other teams. So, United against Brentford, you cannot look beyond Brentford. Ivan Tony, Christian Eriksen, you see the way Eriksen is playing. You saw how they almost defeated Tottenham Hotspur, and Tottenham Hotspur survived by the skin of their teeth. They will come with so much confidence that this is a shambolic United that is there for the taking. So, I will not be too surprised if Brentford comes to Old Trafford and either gets a draw or get a result. United's fate is no longer in their hands to qualify for Champions League. They should just be fighting for the Europa League. And I'm sure that will be disappointing to the new manager in Eric Ten Hag that he would have loved to start with the Champions League. Most big players want to play in the Champions League because that's where the real attention is. Well, coming from what Shemu just said, Manchester United interim manager Ralph Rangnick has called new incumbent to the role Eric Ten Hag as one of the best managers in Europe. Rangnick also opened up about his role moving forward next season and said he will mainly be helping in the recruitment side. The new Austria manager proclaimed that United need to get recruitment right if they are to close up teams like Liverpool, Man City and Chelsea. Rangnick blowing his own trumpets. He says Ten Hag is one of the best coaches in Europe. Yeah, right. Let him come and let's find out. Okay? Now, I told you earlier that I was going to talk about cricket. Shane and I extensively discussed all the issues, but the main issue just walked in. <laughs> okay, so we're discussing the Chuma Anosike Cup. Now, if you haven't heard about this before, it's been going on for about 11 years now. And um, it's only for Southeast states. So if you haven't heard about it, maybe that's why. Now you're here today. Okay, Chuma, welcome on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, let's start with this. Um, everybody watching the show right now will conclude that that guy must be a boxer or a basketballer, or, you know. But um, let's start with my, what's, my question. Everybody who gets involved in sports, I'm saying this honestly right now, everybody who gets involved in sports in Nigeria, it always has an undertow. Okay. It's always about politics. They, are, they don't, they only, see, Nigerians are suffering. Mm. The only opium we have, the only high that we have is sports. <laughs> you know? So, um, why? Okay, okay. We'll take a short break and we'll come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. Like I said earlier, I've got Shuma Anoseke with me. And um, the first question would be, why crickets? Mm, I guess, why not? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, uh, to answer your question, why cricket? Cricket is a sport I've uh, been involved with for maybe, what, 40 or something odd years, right from secondary school in King's College. And, uh, um, you know, it's a sport that has brought great joy to me and a great joy to a lot of friends I have. And I felt um, it would be good for the next generation to sort of enjoy the sort of benefits we had from cricket. So that's a direct answer to your question. Uh, why not cricket? <laughs> okay, um, you see, I asked that question because mm. some of us are not fortunate mm. to go to secondary schools where cricket is the main sport. I was lucky that I did. I went to FGC Worry. Okay. You know what? You went to King's College, the Isla Schools, Government College, Ugeli, you know, and all that. Mm. Um, how has it been? It must have been tough, considering the financial doldrum in Nigeria, mm. how hard things are. And you've sustained this for 11 years. That's like a miracle. Well, we thank God, first of all. And we've had very good partners along the way. It hasn't been a solo effort. 
Um, this year in particular, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, our co-sponsors, Mecano International and uh, the Ekulu Group. They've been wonderful, they've been very supportive. And uh, it's with the help of partners like this that we're able to um, you know, fund this um, event. And we've uh, successfully done it now, like you said, for 11 years. We had a break last year because of COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's good that we've been able to sustain it. And I'm happy that the benefits are beginning to show. Because essentially what informed uh, starting this was that, um, you know, a decade ago we noticed that the game was in serious decline in the southeast. Indeed, I think at that time only a number and perhaps in Yes, I feel to mention that um, the game mm. takes place, this particular competition takes place in the southeast. Yes, it's just the southeast, yes, for now. Um, you know, and that was because, well, obviously I'm from the southeast, so <laughs> that's the first reason. And uh, we noticed that, um, you know, there's been a sharp, sharp decline in the, first of all, in the quality and even in the amount of cricket that was played, very few schools were playing. So that was the initial objective, to sort of revive the game and then um, sustain it. And thank God it's been a fairly successful journey so far. And um, four years ago, we started the female version, because initially it was just male. Uh, four years ago, we got the females involved. And um, this year in Abia, we had the five states participating across both genders. And uh, we had almost 200 young men and women playing uh, the game. So, you know, Shane was telling me something a few minutes ago before we started the program. He said, you guys came together mm. to ensure that every state mm. in the Southeast has their own cricket turf where they can play, which is, I think is fantastic. Mm. Well, that's the objective. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but that's the objective because cricket, as you know, is a game that, um, you know, that, that's where the financial component comes. You need equipment, you need playing facilities. And without those facilities, you can only go so far. So part of our objective now to take the game to the next level in the zone is to have a dedicated cricket facility in each of the five states. And of course, that will come with equipment, as you know. It's an objective, like I said, but you know, we're getting there slowly. OK, uh, for those who don't know, uh, I know him so well, because you know I'm a Obviously. passionate cricket person. <laughs> um, he's a barrister at law. Uh, went to King's College, went to University of Lagos, played for several. And he's also the chairman of Anamba State Cricket Association. He's been a board member of the Nigerian Care Federation. Barista uh, Chuman Osike, looking back at this competition in the last 11 years, would you inwardly say that you have been satisfied with the talents that have been churned out? Yes, I would say so, generally. Um, obviously, I want to achieve more. But um, specifically, um, I want to mention maybe three, four people who played in the last decade who have gone on to play for the national team. That's in the male category. We've had a couple of girls as well who have gone on to play for the uh, national side. Indeed, um, as you are aware, the last um, quadrangular tournament we had with Rwanda and a couple of other countries, a 15-year-old girl, Lilian Ude, yeah. from Ebony State, played for Nigeria. Yeah. You know, that's quite an achievement, um, considering that she only started playing cricket maybe two years ago. So those are the sort of uh, um, achievements we've recorded um, over the last decade, like I said, which is one of the objectives, like I said, when we started, to develop the game and then produce uh, quality players who will hopefully represent the country. I, I, I want to speak on Lilia today because I was a um, match day commentator and MC at that um, Women's um, T20 Championship. Uh, mm -hmm. Lilia today won two man of the match, uh, player of the match, match uh, performance, she was also the best behaved cricketer at the end of that tournament. And I saw the way you held her and you were so excited yourself, uh, Mr. Pasarela, Mr. Okoro, Mr. Chika Okoro, who is a member of the board representing the Southeast, even uh, uh, Mr. Aguilo, and the president of the federation, Mr. Uya Pata. I'm sure you are excited that a 15-year-old who played in your tournament that you are sponsoring is representing Nigeria and one of the top bowlers in Nigeria. Um, I also want to mention the most valuable player at your last tournament, uh, Chimele Udezwe, who said he played at GS3 in 2017. And now he's in SS3 and he got invitation into the national team for the trial. Let me ask you, this T20 competition, has it been a relative success in Nigeria and in the tournament you are hosting? Well, as you know, um, just a quick recap. T20 is probably um, the most modern and most popular form of cricket globally. 
And for now in Nigeria, that's really where our focus is. That and the one over one day game, which is yeah. 50 overs. Uh, for the reasons that we're not quite where we can accede to test playing status. So yes, the T20 has evolved quite nicely. And like I said, that's our main focus for now. And yes, we are working towards preparing our players, both male and female. Like I want to emphasize, this thing is now both uh, yeah. male and female because the ICC wants to push women cricket. Yeah, so we are preparing our players towards that. Um, like as you're aware, the national trial has just finished. And I think we had a couple of people, not just Jimmy, there was somebody else who was part of that uh, this thing. And Lillian, obviously, uh, is part of the female this thing as well. So these are exciting times for us. And uh, we're quite happy that um, you know, some of those that have taken part in the tournament have gone on, like I said, to greater heights. And we will continue. That is something we want to sustain. Okay, at the um, second, uh, at the last um, PwC National Under 17 competition, uh, Southeast came second. And I'm sure that came to you as gladdening because your investment in the Southeast cricket has paid off. Has paid off. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I mean, um, again, that's both male and female. Yes. We, came, uh, we won, um, you know, silver. Um, one match was particularly close. I think the South-South uh, pipped us both times. But, you know, if you compare that to where we were 10 years ago, I'm not even sure the South is featured in any tournament, really. Uh -huh. So it's a very positive development. But I want to thank, it's not all about me. I want yeah. to emphasize that we've had a team working with us. And I want to thank the parents of the kids as well, because... With someone like Lillian, we had to literally appeal to her mom. Yes. It's not easy, given the cha challenges we have in Nigeria, to allow your daughter at 15 to go travel yeah, to travel a young girl. East, you know? uh, we had to make special arrangements for her to be able to participate. But I'm happy because what has happened is that it has opened up a new vista for her, for her family, for her school, sure that. and all her friends. So, which is one of the things we wanted to achieve as well, because with that now, there's a positive narrative with all that's going on, not just in the East, in the rest of the country. If these kids have something positive to look forward to, they tell their friends about it. People now want to be involved in cricket because they see it as a possible path to a career. I was going to ask yes. that question. Yes. You mm -hmm. see, um, it's easy for you to lure youths off the streets when it comes to games like basketball, mm. when it comes to games like football. How hard is it to lure youths to come to cricket? Now, that's where T20 comes in because T20 is not your old classic cricket where everybody's wearing white and going around with red balls. As you can see, this is not a cricket jersey, but this is similar to what you would wear in T20. So it's, uh, it, it's colorful, it's, uh, it's social, you understand? And it's not as long as playing a test match. So, you know, typically a T20 match will last you four or five hours. So it's something you can get young people to relate with, you know. In between the overs, you have some music, there's banter, you know, there's music and so on. So that way, we're able to make cricket more... Uh, psychedelic, yes, <laughs> more appealing to the youth. And I, I must say it's worked. And if you create, like I said, something sustainable for them, because now there's something to look forward to every year. So I think that that's something we'll manage to achieve. And we hope we'll build on that in the years going forward. What is the next, next edition? Well, hopefully the next year. We normally have a small committee that meets to decide where the venue will be. Because what we want to do is to move around all the five southeast states. We don't want it to be, those states will monopolize it. So it's likely to be a Bonny or Enugu who will just decide in the next few months and then we'll make an announcement. But it sounds good. Um, you started from young playing cricket for King's College. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're so passionate about development. Mm -hmm. It's not all about hosting the Barista Chuma Anosike uh, cricket competition. Is there plans in place for SECA, which is the Southeast Cricket Association, to have what we call a developmental program that can continue to churn out talent, which will also be in line with the vision of the president of the Federation who said every year we want to churn out about 250,000 kids playing cricket. That's a very good question. SECA, I'm happy you've introduced SECA. That's the Southeast Cricket Association. Essentially, it's an umbrella body for the five Southeast states. So each state has its own cricket association, but we have this umbrella body because we felt coming together, there will be economies of scale, there's, uh, we can access funds, we can access sponsors and uh, facilities which may be difficult for each state on its own to access. So yes, yeah, SECA does have a developmental program which is in line with the NCR program. Um, so it's something, again, like I said, we will, maybe SECA will make an appropriate announcement at the time, but I'll give you a heads up. Um, you know, it's something we're working on. And I always emphasize, the more cricket is played, the better. Because at the moment, we do actually don't have enough tournaments. So 
sector in the near future will probably come up with a sector, a specific sector competition, uh, which may or may not be an age grade tournament. But developmental uh, plans are in place as far as sector. Barista Chibanoseke, I wish I could have the whole day with you, but um, we really don't have time. But I, I am promising you out there um, who just watch this program, I will make sure. I try and bring him back on the show, so maybe next week or in two weeks, and of course, you, you will take a time, and I'll, I'll open the phone lines so you can actually call and ask him questions, okay? I promise you that. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. At such no, a short notice. No, no problem. Shivaji Legba, thank, thank you very much. You Always so a much. pleasure, and uh, I want to commend uh, Barista Chuma Anasike. Doing something like this for 11 years is wow. not me feet. It's massive. Mm -hmm. At the last massive. tournament, there were trophies, there were awards, there were cash prizes, they were even rewards for individual performances. Best batter, best bowler, best fielder, best wicket keeper, everything. And doing something like this for 11 years on a consistent basis without any political agenda. Like I, I, I want said to before, be, it's a miracle. Yeah, so wow. for us, it's, it's huge. Thank, Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, behind the cameras, we have Isaac Zico. You can't see him, but he makes you see us. Thank you very much, Francis Inden. I call him Francois. Thank you. Thank you very much, K. Coyote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, PG. Um, Tayo, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, PG. Um, Paul George, I call him the President General. And downstairs in the powerhouse, thank you very much, Dio D1. Thank you very much, Femi. My name is Wally Scott. You know, same time next week. Like I always advise you, at the end of every show, if not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports.